If you're watching this video, then there's a pretty high chance that at one time or another, you've dreamed of owning a real-life Star Trek tricorder. Actually, they already exist. Well, kind of. There are devices called XRF analyzers. XRF devices, or X-ray fluorescence machines, allow us to directly measure the elemental composition of pretty much any solid material. And they come in all different shapes and sizes, but the type that really captures the imagination is the handheld portable type. And it is easy to see where the connection to Star Trek comes from. But even these smaller portable devices cost a king's ransom, so we were wondering if there was some way to do something similar, but using the stuff we have kicking around the workshop. Instead of using the principle of X-ray fluorescence, which requires a source of X-rays, as well as an X-ray spectrometer, we are going to try and use a much simpler technique. What we are going to do is use the backscattering of beta radiation, and try to use this to detect the element within the sample. So, first we had better explain what we are proposing for this experiment, and what backscattering actually is. In this experiment, we are going to fire beta particles, or electrons as they are better known, at a target made out of the elements we are going to be testing. The samples we are testing are all pretty small, so only a small fraction of the electrons will actually strike the target. So let's just zoom in, and take a look at why this backscattering occurs. The nucleus of the target material has a positive electric charge, and this will attract the negatively charged electrons towards it. If any electrons come quite close to a nucleus, then their trajectory will be changed. But, a very few of these fast-moving electrons, will come so close to the nucleus, that they can actually end up going back out the way they came. And, it is these backscattered electrons that we are going to be measuring. But, if the nucleus is larger, i.e. from an element of a higher atomic number, then the nucleus will have a greater positive charge, and so be able to backscatter more electrons. This means that the dose rate measured by the detector will be proportional to the element number of the target. What is important, is that we don't change the geometry of anything about the measurement between testing different elements. So we decided to buy these 1 cm cubed element samples. We could have got larger ones, which would give better results, but we only have a very small budget for this experiment. Here are the 13 test samples we have bought. They aren't as well spread out in the periodic table as we would like, but that's what you get when you do experiments on a channel that isn't monetized. But hopefully, we have enough samples that we can get some good results for this experiment. For the source of our beta particles, we're going to use strontium-90. So now all that we have to do is take our supply of strontium-90 out of containment and get it ready for this experiment. Nah, just kidding. This tiny check source is what we're going to be using for our little experiment. For some reason, strontium-90 seems to have a pretty bad reputation. We told you that this green LED would come in handy for something. Righto, let's get this experiment set up. For this experiment, we're going to be using a very low-cost, Chinese-made Geiger counter, the FS5000. It costs $48 on AliExpress. If you want to know more about this device, there's a review linked in the description below. For the source of beta particles, we have a strontium-90 check source, which was taken from this vintage Geiger counter. It's quite a strong source of beta particles. It gives a dose rate of about 2 mSv per hour in direct contact with the detector. Again, we've made a video about this device, which is linked below in the description. This experiment is actually very simple, 
but let me just show you the setup. The source holder, containing the strontium-90, only allows the beta particles to be emitted in the forward direction. This simplifies the experimental setup. Then there is the sample of the element being tested, which is arranged to be in the middle of the beam of electrons. Next, there is the Geiger counter, and this has been arranged so that the Geiger-Muller tube is closest to the path of any backscattered beta particles. And finally, there is a lead shield, to prevent any beta particles, going directly from the source to the detector. When everything is correctly arranged, the path of peak intensity for backscattered beta particles, should be like this. We made a simple jig, to hold all of the components together. It's very important that the geometry doesn't change during the experiment. This 3D printed part holds the source, the sample, and the shielding, and also sets the distance to the counter. So now, we just need to set up the experiment. The source is bolted to the jig. You can see here that there is a spring-loaded steel door over the source. We will keep that closed until the experiment is started. And we also have a sheet of lead, placed in front of the experiment, just for good measure. With small sources like this though, distance is always the best shielding. We're using the highly scientific method of fixing everything in place using Bluetack. Let's get on and run this experiment. We have a small collection of low-cost Geiger counters. But what makes this one ideal for this experiment is that it has a PC application that can log the data via USB. This enables good averaging to be performed over the 15 minutes of each experiment. First up, we have magnesium, with an atomic number of 12. This sample has the lowest atomic number of all the specimens we're going to test in this experimental setup. We probably should have sampled over an even longer duration, but patience is a finite resource around here. The PC application is able to export the dose rate data to a CSV file. The data is logged with a two second sample rate, so there's plenty of data to create a good average from. Next up, aluminium with an atomic number of 13. As you can see, the source is covered with a strip of lead before changing the element specimen being tested. There's already enough idiots out there being rather careless with this type of thing. Whilst this source isn't particularly dangerous, humans are fragile creatures. When making a video like this, the viewers only get to see less than 10% of the actual experimentation that is carried out. There is just no downside to excessive protection, for my human pets. We won't bore you with the hours of footage we got from this experiment, but all of the element samples were tested and all of the data was logged. It quickly became evident that a pattern was forming. The higher the atomic number of the element, the higher the dose rate that the counter recorded. We also needed to take a background measurement of the whole system, but without a sample being in place. This allows the Bremsstrahlung radiation that the strontium-90 source will generate to also be accounted for in the final calculation. OK, let's take a look at the results. Although the PC software for the FS5000 is pretty clunky, the data offload process is fairly smooth. And once the data has been imported into Excel, obtaining a 15-minute average is easy. Put simply, the more data you have to work with, the more accurate the result will be. Once all the results are tabulated and the background is subtracted, we can see there is a strong correlation between the measured dose rate and the element number of the material being tested. When we plot these results out, we can see that there are only three measurements that disagree with the general trend. These slight errors occur for the measurements of chromium, cobalt, and copper. These elements are in a tight group, and this result is probably just reflective of the general level of uncertainty in the measurements. 
Obviously, having a collection of samples which are so closely spaced in the periodic table means that even small errors will be highly noticeable. Now what is strange is that in the available literature on the subject, it is stated that when the line is plotted out with an element number on the logarithmic scale, the results should be a straight line. But what we see is the opposite. We get a better approximation to a straight line when plotted out on a linear axis. I think that this might be a result of the fact that glass Geiger Muller tubes are not great at measuring beta particles. The glass tube and the plastic enclosure of the counter will block many lower energy beta particles. As you can see, in the region of the higher Z numbers, there is almost a perfect straight line traced on a logarithmic scale, but the low Z number elements give a different response. One explanation for this, might be if the backscattered electrons are not just more numerous, for high Z number elements, but also of a higher energy. So, it's time for another quick experiment. This is the KC761, an alpha, beta and gamma ray spectrometer. And we can use this to figure out if the backscatter beta energy of high and low Z number elements has any major differences. So we made a measurement of the backscatter energy from aluminium and from lead, and indeed there was a difference. The first thing to point out is that the beta detector on this device is a pin diode. This means that there are quite a lot of limitations in terms of the beta energy levels it can detect. Firstly, the top layer of the pin diode silicon sandwich will absorb a lot of the low energy beta particles. This imposes a lower limit on the detection energy of around 100 kV. Then, the higher energy beta particles have a detection limit that is imposed by the limited stopping power of the intrinsic layer. This is made worse, because it is only a very thin layer of silicon that is able to detect these particles. In this energy plot, the red curve is the backscattered energy of the aluminium sample, and the white one is from the lead sample. Whilst the peak count for the aluminium is higher, the overall count seen by the detector is about two and a half times higher for the backscattered particles from the lead sample. What is most important to note though, is that the higher atomic number of the test sample, the higher the energy spectra of the backscattered beta particles. This could explain why our result differs from other published experimental data. OK, let's just take a look at what this all means and see if our little experiment can be judged as having been successful. What our experiment has shown is that even with a very simple setup, it is possible to see a strong correlation between the count rate of high and low atomic number elements. This is a very good start, but before getting excited, what can also be seen is that due to a number of issues, we're not able to accurately discriminate between adjacent elements. In fact, as the experiment is currently arranged, we probably only have a system accuracy of plus and minus 3z. Another good outcome from this experiment is that I think that we have understood the reasons for the lack of accuracy. I also think that we have possible solutions for all of them. Put simply, I think that if we chose to do so, we would be able to construct a system based upon beta backscattering that was able to reliably discriminate between each element. It should also be pointed out that although uncommon, commercial examples of beta backscattering systems do exist. These have been used in instruments that are designed to detect lead paint or to identify plating materials. These systems have a very significant cost advantage over XRF-based products. If we were to construct a system that was designed to be a lot more accurate, there are a couple of changes that we would make. Firstly, we would seek to reduce the mean path that the backscattered beta particles need to take. Currently this is about 10 cm, if we were able to reduce that to around 2 cm, then immediately we would see count rates about 25 times higher. This would reduce the time needed for each measurement, and also improve the accuracy. Having more counts can only improve things. 
and then, we would change the Geiger Muller tube, for a type that doesn't use a glass envelope and have a thick plastic case, right in the back scattering path. For this, a tube with a mica window would be ideal. We would also expect that such a tube to have a higher sensitivity, again reducing the acquisition time and increasing accuracy. It should be noted though, that no matter how much the system is improved, it will never have the capabilities of a professional XRF system. For starters, it cannot successfully analyse metal alloys. This technique can only be used to identify pure elements. This technique cannot work with compounds either. Any changes in density will significantly affect the measurement. So the million dollar question, will we build a version 2 system? I'm not sure. We already have a very long pipeline of projects that we're working on. But let's see. And do we think that the experiment was a success? Well, I guess we need to get Arthur to answer that question. Given that my clumsy human assistants normally cock up even the simplest experiments that I ask them to do, and this one actually got some results. I think it is safe to say that this experiment was a roaring success. Anyway, that is all we have for you today. We hope you enjoyed our little video, or at least found some parts of it interesting. If you want to see more of this kind of video, you could always press the subscribe button. This is not a monetized channel, and we don't have any sponsors. So we can say what we want, and YouTube's algorithm can go and get f***ed. Thank you for your time.